I'd like to uh, invite you to contemplate on where you are right now in time as an individual, but also as humanity. Where are we? Where are we and where do we would like to be in 20, 30, 50 years' time? Try to imagine waking up in 2072, 50 years or 60 years from now. You look out of your window, if you still have one, what would it look like? What would life look like on the street? It's not easy. It's not easy to get a clear picture of what that might look like, is it? There's a few reasons why it's not easy. One reason is because the future is still very uncertain. There's a lot of things that can happen between now and 50 years from now. So immediately, when we start thinking about the future inside our minds, what happens is that a lot of different images flash by. Images that are mostly shaped by our previous experience, our past experiences, and the way we experience the present. Now, another reason why it's difficult is because when I ask you to do that, you do it on your own, inside your mind. But something very interesting happens when we start externalizing that process, when we start thinking about the future out loud, when we start rendering that future, that image that we have in front of our mind's eye, when we start turning that into something tangible. Because then we can start sharing it with others. And I'm not just about talking about the experts. What happens then is, for example, that an entrepreneur who's put in front of the image of the future that an artist has in his mind sees possibilities, sees opportunities. A policymaker might see that the image that the farmer in Africa has inside his mind offers opportunities for him, offers perhaps even solutions, or makes him ask new questions about where he takes his policies. It's by sharing those images of the future that a diversity of questions and of solutions is, is, comes to the foreground. And we need that diversity, believe me, because if we look around, what we witness today is not a crisis of a single industry. It's not a crisis of a single region or country. It's a crisis of some of the very systemic foundations on which we've built our societies. And if we want to alter that system, if we want to improve upon it, a quick fix is not going to do it. We're going to have to question our assumptions. And these assumptions are sometimes very deep down. One of the assumptions, or one of the mistakes, I dare to argue, that we've made is that we've placed such high emphasis on monoculture that it's become dangerous. I'm not saying monoculture as in the food we grow and that we eat. I'm talking about monoculture in terms of logic, in terms of thoughts, in terms of images about the future, in terms of the way we develop policies, the way we define success, the way we run our boardrooms of our companies. We need different perspectives there to challenge the status quo. Because if there's one thing that nature teaches us, it's that diversity breeds resilience. So if you want a resilient future, a future in which success can be that of many, then we need to invest in that diversity. As we go about exchanging views on the future, with each other, with the person next to you, with a stakeholder in your company, with a shareholder, with a policymaker. We're not looking for that one solution, that one perfect future in which everything falls in place. What we're actually trying to do is, or what we should try to do, is to create the processes and tools that allow us to exchange those images, those stories about what tomorrow could be like, and also to use those stories to turn them into action. Because in each of these images, in each of these stories of what tomorrow might be like, the way you see it today and the way that might change tomorrow, in each of these, there's a gateway to new solutions, to new questions that require it to be asked. Because in essence, all of us are world builders. As children, we are born as fearless experimenters. We build towers with bricks only to see them topple over. We challenge the constructions that we make. And in doing so, we learn. We play together, and that playfulness, 
That room for experimentation is something that we should move beyond just the kindergarten stage. We should move it back into where the important decisions are made. And that's not just a boardroom. That's not just in Parliament. That's in a lot of places. But it all starts with the image that you have in mind. That image creates the options that you see, the options to change the status quo. So when we go out as facilitators of such a process, for example, when we were asked a few years ago um, to look into the future, what the future might look like for society when genetic testing makes its way into the mainstream. So you go out into a hospital, you get your genome sequenced, and you get a risk profile for the rest of your life. It's not about whether you would like that or not. I mean, it's also about that, but it's about a lot more. When we went into that process, we didn't just ask the people building the technology, which is, of course, very interesting, very fascinating, but we also asked the patients. We also asked policymakers. We also asked people from insurance companies, from people on the labor market, how do you see the world change under the influence of that technology? What are the images that you have in your mind? And what was interesting is that as we went about it, it was not just about the technology changing society, but the discussions of how society might evolve, shaping perhaps even technology. And it's that bi-directional thought that only rises above if you share these different views on what the future might bring. And for that, before we can do that, we need to render the future tangible. I mentioned a technological example, but it goes for a lot of different uh, examples as well, for societal reasons, for technological reasons. Everything that could have a major impact on the way society develops requires anticipation, requires thought, requires reflection. As we engage in this, such an activity of collaborative future making, as I like to call it, we turn futures into tools. We turn those images into instruments. Instruments for thought, but also instruments that inspire towards action. And I'd like to share a few examples with you how we turn those futures into tangible artifacts. Imagine waking up in a world in which resources, natural resources, are governed at the global level, in which Western values are in decline, in which transparency rules the planet. What does, our, what does uh, agriculture look like in such a world? What does it mean to a farmer? That world we translated into a map, a map of concepts, a map of all the things that make up this world, the building bricks of that future world. But the map serves as an externalization of that world, as a visualization, and as such it becomes an invitation to engage as an explorer into what this world might mean. So the future becomes a tool in order to render something visible. But it's also a source of inspiration. And of course, images are very powerful communicators, uh, challenging people to think things through, to get them inspired, to engage in new adventures. But images also have something tricky. When they're too polished, they turn futures into things that are to take or to leave. So that's one of the reasons why, throughout the years, we've used a lot more sketching when we discuss futures with people. Why? Because a sketch is an invitation to change. It lowers the threshold. It shows you that the future is not fixed, that you're still anticipating, that you're still in a phase in which you can change it. And it is that that moves people towards action. So if we bring the future onto people's skin through the various senses, if we create the tangibility of the future through the different senses, we also make use of bridging what we know today, the way we're used to dealing with that sensory information today, and the way that might be different tomorrow. When you look at an image like this, you immediately recognize a certain code. You read it as an advertisement. And from advertisements, we know that people are trying to sell us something new, that it's just around the corner, that's going to make our lives a lot better, but that there's also something tricky. We should question what they're selling to us. We should be critical. And believe me, we have become a very much more critical audience. So if you read here that in the future, which looks very nearby now, 
You go into a shop and you buy a cartridge for your printer and your printer stick. What does that do to you? What does it make you question? Which new questions rise up in your mind? This is not that far away future. 30 kilometers from here in Maastricht, people are exactly looking into these kinds of technologies. But what's important is that we use the code in order to engage people in the conversation. Just as we engage people through headlines, headlines that become gateways to exploring the rest of the world that, that, that's embodied in the image, the rest of the world that's in that image of the future. But as I said, it's not just about visual information and how that can engage people in conversations about the future. It's also about engaging them in the most bodily way, in the most physical way. And it's marvelous to see that when we move into boardrooms of companies, or we move into rooms of policymakers, and we tell them, this afternoon, you're going to be the bricoleur. Maybe that's what they do anyway, any day. But now they're going to do it in a hands-on way. And what happens is that they realize all of a sudden that what happens up there, the thinking, happens also down there with their hands. Thinking with your hands opens up a different part of your brain to do its work. And it's important also there to employ the diversity. If we want a diverse set of ideas, if we want to break through the monoculture of ideas, of logic, we also need to change in way, the ways in which we come to the, the, the ideas. And that's one of the reasons why we invest a lot of time in using design methods, speculative design methods, in order to render the future tangible and allow people to do so, to build it on their own. Because as they go about it, what they do is create a common ground a common ground of understanding. You want to start to understand why a certain person doesn't share your view. What are the reasons? How would he change your image? And maybe that leads to alignment between the two. That is a very fertile ground for vision building, for new strategies, for new concepts, for products and services. But thinking about the future, it's not much use if you don't start doing anything about it. So while you go through these processes of rendering it tangible, sometimes the best way to do it is that once you've identified a challenge, you use those same techniques in order to start making the change. So when in the process we identified that social cohesion would be one of the major challenges, or the lack of social cohesion, or the decline in, in Western cities would be one of the major challenges for the coming years, we started to look into ways and in how we could improve that. And we built a kit allowing people to use their own window as a museum, a window into their world, as a starting point for conversation. So the very way of prototyping the future can also take place through action. So the clouds have cleared up a little. By rendering the future tangible, by exchanging views, interesting processes start to take place. New gateways to new possibilities to new questions are opened up. So my talk today, my plea actually, is to take a little bit more time, to invite you to take more time in whatever activity you're involved in, to reflect, to preflect, to project images of what you think the future could be like, should be like, might come to be like. To be critical about that, to share it with others. And because we think that invitation is very valuable, we'd like to, when I was talking with my colleagues a few months ago, we said we, we, we ought to do something to create a dedicated moment on which we ask people to stand still, to reflect for a moment, to stop doing and start thinking, start being critical. We start, how can we nudge people into creating that dedicated moment? So that's when the idea arised to create perhaps something that we could call a world what-if day. One day in a year in which we dedicate ourselves to reflect upon what tomorrow might be like, to share those images, to render tangible what we have up there in order to improve that image, not just for ourselves, but also for others, and to see what might grow out of that. Because every one of us knows that the choices that we make today defines our future but it's the diversity of ways in which we envision the future that create our options for tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>